Okay, so um, I'm just summarizing here on the board uh, the things you've covered over the past uh, eight lectures, I think. Um, and uh, so we're considering the sort of Hubbard model. Uh, and here's the phase diagram we've been sketching. So um, at very large U and half filling, uh, and up, and I up, and I down equals one half. Uh, we know that we have the antiferromagnetic ground state, an insulator with a broken spin rotation symmetry. Then we also know at very small u, there's a Fermi liquid state where the electrons are nearly free. Um, and then we studied the onset of this broken symmetry in the Fermi liquid uh, and discovered that there's a metallic state that's an antiferromagnet uh, in which the Fermi surface has become rather complicated. Um, Okay, and furthermore, then we took these metallic states either uh, in either starting from here from the funny liquid or sort of an ansatz we made on what happened when you change the density of, away from an antiferromagnet. magnet. Uh, and from both approaches, we ended up with a D wave superconductor. So here's the wave function of the D wave superconductor, some mean field BCS like wave function. Um, this, you create uh, an upspin particle at point R1, a downspin particle at point R2, and you multiply it by the Cooper pair wave function, uh, which in this case depends only on the difference of the coordinates. Uh, there's no dependence on the average coordinate. Uh, and you take N over two such pairs and act on the ground state, on the empty state. Uh, so this function G uh, has to be an even function of G. Uh, and that you can uh, verify implies that this thing is a spin singlet, uh, because if this is even under interchange of R1 minus R2, uh, you can see that this part is odd under the interchange of spin because of the fermion anti-commutation relations. Um, also 190 degree rotations, this function G change is sign, and that's the reason for the word uh, D wave. Okay. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, which uh, is actually going to be crucial for everything we're going to talk about today, uh, there is a slight difference uh, between this wave function that you get starting from this approach, uh, which was the paramagnon theory, uh, as opposed to starting from this approach, uh, which was the theory obtained from the TJ model. Uh, the difference is that in this approach, uh, you have another operation here uh, which I call P. So let me put this operator P. So this is a projection operator, which uh, projects onto W occupied sites. So P is product on I, one minus N I up. So this is another complicated operator uh, involving, uh, you know, uh, arbitrary high powers of the fermion operator, uh, and it acts on every site. And if that site is doubly occupied, that has both up spin and down spins, uh, you just delete it from this expansion. So when you expand this out, this is a very large number of terms after you integrate over R1 and R2, you just drop a few terms in there. That would be an answer for the kind of superconductor you would get from here. Uh, and that, roughly speaking, is a paraphrase of the arguments that, uh, that, that this, this wave function is a way of encapsulating some of the Anders, uh, arguments that Anderson made in the early days. Uh, so in the early days, uh, there was also the thought uh, that, in fact, this wave function with the P uh, is different from the wave function without the P. Uh, today, we know that's not true. Uh, and we're going to you know, start with a lot of uh, developments which will make that evidently obvious, although it's not obvious in the early days. But it became clear within a few years. Uh, and roughly speaking, just jumping ahead a bit, what we'll see is that this kind of constraint of projecting out some sectors of Hilbert space is very naturally done using a gauge theory. So there's an emergent gauge field that we'll talk about uh, actually as soon as today. Uh, and so what happens is that in this particular state, uh, in fact, there's a U1 gauge field, but the U1 gauge field is fully Higgs. So there's a Higgs boson too, and all the gauge fluctuations that gaps out by the Higgs boson. Uh, 
uh, I should say gaps and codes because there are always some gapless excitations from the uh, presence of the of density fluctuations. But okay, <laughs> uh, we'll get to that eventually. So, so this this gauge structure that's uh, demanded by this projection operator, uh, you know, you into, for a while it looks very important, but then eventually you find that it actually makes no difference to the structure of the superconductor because of the Higgs mechanism. All right. Okay, so now uh, let's move a little closer to the real world. And here I've drawn uh, the famous phase diagram of the cuprates. And what we're doing here in this phase diagram <laughs> Uh, is moving along this green arrow. You start from the insulator. So as up to this point, the density remains one half. Uh, and then the density decreases from one, uh, one half per, per, per spin. So that whole line, this part of the line uh, is just this point here. So that this point maps on to this entire line up to here. Um, and then when you cross into the metallic state and you change the density, uh, well, that's this axis here, which we call doping. So doping is labeled by P, and this is the measure of P. You take the total number of electrons, uh, and the difference from one is P. We're talking about hole doping. Um, there are also materials which you electron dope, one plus P, but uh, they're very similar, yes. Convention one half or one? Sorry? So the convention for N uh, up is one half over there, or is it one? Well, this is a ni up and ni down is one half. Oh, thank you, sir. And this is the sum, which is one. Thank you, sorry. Okay. So I also, uh, there's a reason I specified that. I'm, we're going to discuss the system of great detail today. And I'm going to restrict myself in that discussion to states uh, of this type. They can also be ferromagnets where all the spins point up. Uh, but that's, I don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, ferromagnet is kind of a trivial state, uh, which is also an insulator. Uh, but I want to, I don't want to, I want to exclude those states. I have a question. Yes. Before, when you wrote a P with n sub i, if this is the property, is it either raised or hidden? When you wrote the P as an is a sum over, is it is a product over i with a projection operator? Is this three? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So here, you, n i is the actual value of the This operator. is an operator, yes. Thank Whereas you. the other NIs are averages, right? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, put a few hats. So these are operators. No, I, I think it's clear, but... Uh, but these are without the, without, without the hats, they're the expectation values. Thank you. Right, so this is a very complicated operator. This is just an operator. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you dope here, and what happens is that uh, for a while you remain an antiferromagnet. Uh, now, since the density away from one half, uh, this region here uh, should be, you know, this anti. I haven't told you where the antiferromagnetic metal exists. Probably it exists all the way down here. So this should be an antiferromagnetic metal here. Uh, but it's not a very good metal because these are not perfect crystals. There's just a lot, very dilute concentration of holes, uh, and they get tracked by the disorder. So it's effectively an insulator. Let me just put insulator in quotes. Okay. And then there's a whole mess of stuff that happens here, which I'm not drawing because we could spend the rest of the course talking about all those things. Uh, but what happens universally after P is above around uh, 0.06 or 0.07, uh, you get a D wave superconductor, which is you know, you know, very robust. And as far as we can tell, uh, well described by this wave function. Uh, when you're a very small P in this region, maybe you need this to get good, uh, good uh, numbers. But once you're out there, it, you may not even need this. But there's no phase transition as far as we can tell in, inside the superconductor. It's some smoothly evolving state between the small u and the large u limits. Okay, so, you know, it sounds like things are going well. This very simple theory, uh, well, in hindsight, seems to be very successful. Uh, so what's the problem? Um, well, the problem is what happens 
uh, when you raise the temperature. So now we have another axis, which is temperature. And so we're going to try to go up. And as I already mentioned, there's a whole bunch of complexity here having to do with various charge density wave states, type states, uh, what happens in the magnetic field, effects of disorder. Uh, you know, it's amazing how much work has been done and, uh, and much has been sorted out. Very, very beautiful work uh, of sorting out what's happening here. Uh, but I want to, I won't talk about that in the course. Uh, but what also happens is once you get to above about, let's say 150 Kelvin, things seem to simplify again. Uh, and you get a picture that's, uh, you know, very much at odds with the, uh, at least the small u picture. It's not, uh, and you might say, well, this is some high temperature mess. Well, but just keep in mind that 150 K uh, is much lower than the value of J. Uh, so like J was 40 squared over U. Uh, and that's around 2000 Kelvin. Maybe a bit, bit below. So this is still a very low temperature. Uh, and so many of us think, and a majority of you, I would say, uh, that what's going on here is still quantum physics. It's the physics of some other types of quantum ground states, uh, which in the real world, you know, become something else at very low temperatures. But in some abstract world of model space, uh, these would also be zero temperature phases that are uh, either stable or nearly stable. So we want to understand uh, those phases. Uh, and there's roughly three phases. One is, of course, the well-understood Fermi liquid, or there's a strange metal here near what we call optimal doping and a pseudo gap metal. So that's where we want to go. And that's and studying the pseudo gap metal and the strange metal will be like the last part of the course. So however, uh, it's preparation for that. And this is, you know, what happened theoretically too. These questions that started appearing just seemed very, very difficult. It was hard to make, uh, you know, analytic progress. Although, you know, there were a lot of attempts, and some of them uh, more right than others. Uh, but what turned out to be very useful in the in this development is to focus on a simpler class of problem, which is what I'm going to do now which is to ask questions about the insulator itself. Go back to P equals zero. Uh, and then yes, we agree that it's an antiferromagnet in the real world, but perhaps that antiferromagnet is hiding some physics. And there's some other sets of insulators here, uh, which will tell us more about uh, what's going on at Connector. That's, you know, I haven't justified that hope, uh, but I would claim that history has shown that that particular point of view has been very, very thoughtful. So I'm going to restrict myself to a simpler set of questions. Yes. So uh, this picture with the pseudograph, the strange metal and the Fermi liquid comes essentially from experiment, right? Now. Absolutely, absolutely. There's also a lot of numerical work on the Hubbard model. I mean, uh, that's very hard to do very precisely because of the sign problem, uh, but there's been a lot of heroic efforts with big computers and special algorithms. Uh, and I think you do see the three phases in the numerical work too. Is there some, uh, uh, some notion of uh, what the transition between different phases is, which sort of- Yeah, so let's leave that for okay. the future. <laughs> uh, is it, yeah, the same to, so the implicit in my statement uh, that these are distinct quantum phases, that there must be some sharp phase transitions, at least at zero temperature. Although in the real world, we're not, something else happens at zero temperature. But in some model space, say SYK model space, uh, we can study such questions. <laughs> yeah. And when you say model space, then you're not, not thinking about the Hubbard model, you're thinking about some other model? Well, uh, you have some freedom as a theorist. Uh, for example, even in the context of the Hubbard model, you can uh, vary the TIJ. You can put yourself on different lattices, or different TIJ. It already is a very rich model space. Uh, it's still hard to solve, but uh, I think, yeah, that's probably sufficient, I would say. Other questions in India? So on that summary of what we have covered so far. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to focus the next few lectures uh, on the following question. We're going to go back to the insulator uh, and we're going to ask, uh, and so that means, so we have electrons in some set of models uh, and, and NIL average is equal to NI. No, average is equal to one half. Um, and I'm gonna ask the following question. Uh, are there ground states of, with an energy gap of, which do not break any symmetries? Um, of the Hamiltonian. And which Hamiltonian? Well, really, <laughs> I have a great deal of freedom here. Uh, I am assuming you have done with some regular lattice, could be square, triangle, octagon, or whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a general class of Hamiltonians. You could even have second neighbor interactions, full of interactions, whatever. It really, actually, this is a very, very broad uh, set of Hamiltonians. And I asked this very simple question, uh, assuming that there is no net spin polarization and the total density of electrons is one. Uh, are there any states with, a, with an energy gap that don't break any symmetries? Uh, so the answer to this question in one dimension is actually no, there are none. Uh, and that's what's called the Leap Schultz Mattis theorem. Uh, and uh, so in D equals one, the answer is no. And, and that's the LSM theorem. Okay, I, I won't go through that here, but uh, eventually see where the origins of this. Um, yeah, also I should say that, uh, yeah, this is, this is a model of course, which conserves total number of electrons. So there's a U1 charge symmetry. The Hamiltonian at least conserves the uh, total number of electrons um, and therefore, uh, uh, and you're not allowed to go superconducting because that would break the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, but the answer in D equals two, which is what I'm going to focus on uh, is yes. There, there are, uh, no, there were a few states discovered. Now we know almost an infinite library of them. There's a huge rich possibilities of ground states at hot filling, uh, which have an energy gap to all excitations break no symmetries. So in D equals two, there was a, well, before I get there, let me also ask a corresponding question uh, for bosons. So for bosons, you can have a similar question and we can use either language. Uh, and the bosons, you can simply again ask uh, where you have NB, the number of bosons uh, is equal to one. So you can ask the same question. If you have bosons, spinless bosons at integer filling, sorry, not one, uh, one half. So bosons at integer filling, of course, form the mod insulator. That's what we began the course with. Uh, but bosons at half integer filling, where the number of, where the boson number is a conserved quantity. Uh, is there any ground state uh, which does not break any symmetries? Okay, and this is an analogous, analogous question uh, because you know we know that at least in the larger limit we can map this model into a model of spins. Uh, so for you can take uh, the upspin uh, and map it onto a boson state, and the downspin map it onto the no boson state. Um, and so then the spin raising operator as plus, uh, it gets maps to just P dagger. Uh, SZ is P dagger D P minus a half. 
Um, and here, this is a hot core boson, but the, quest, the statement can be a much broader set of systems uh, is equal to zero or one, nothing else on every site. So you can't put more than, you can't put more than uh, one boson at any site. So this system of bosons that are filling exactly maps to a system of spins. However, the, the statement uh, can be made for any system of bosons. Uh, if, you know, I don't care, take a system of bosons that are filling, uh, can you give me a, a state with a gap with breaks no symmetries? Okay, the answer again is yes. And, the, and I'm going to use both languages, mostly the spin language, but later on the boson language. Might be useful. Uh, but it's easy to keep that in mind. Okay, so the fact that the answer may be yes uh, was first proposed by Anderson uh, way back in 1973. Uh, you give it an ansatz for the kind of wave function that might do this. Um, so, this Anderson three, uh, and he proposed what uh, resonating valence bond state. So this state, uh, you know, has its origins in actually nineteenth century physics in benzene. Hekule proposed a state for benzene where you had two different uh, configurations. Double bonds and a hexagonal ring, and they resonated with each other. Then later in the 40s, Pauling proposed that he wrote down an RGB wave function for an, a, a electrons on a lattice um, and said this was how this is what metals were. Uh, evidently, he didn't believe in Bloch's theorem or things like that. Uh, so Pauling's proposal wasn't right. Uh, and then in 1973, Anderson said, well, uh, Pauling's proposal may have worked for metals because of Bloch's theorem, uh, but it will work for more insulators. So the R will be state, uh, it's easy to write it down in pictures, uh, is sum over uh, different diamond coverings of, so let's say, the square lattice of the triangle lattice with some coefficients, CD. Uh, and what D represents. Um, is a state with here's a square lattice. And, and you take some covering um, and you, uh, you, they may not even be nearest neighbor. Uh, you know, there's an amazingly rich set of possibilities here. You know, in some ways, this is an empty statement. Um, it's a because any single state of the system can be written in expansion of this form. Uh, so it's all really a matter of what is CDR. Uh, and so there's an exponentially large number of diamond coverings of the square lattice. Uh, and here, of course, by this ellipse, uh, I mean the spin singlet state, uh, up, down, minus down, up. Um, and if you want, if you like the boson language, it's one over root two, uh, B dagger one minus B dagger two, acting on the empty state on those two sides. So it's either this balance bond or the spin singlet or the EPR pair, depending on what you're thinking of. Uh, and then this is just a boson, you know, rattling back and forth between the two sides. So the average density of bosons is one half because there's two sites and there's only one boson. Yeah. Is there a restriction how far they can go? Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so this was just an answer. This is, this is about as much as Pauling and Anderson said in those days. Uh, yeah, so this is, you know, there's a huge rich variety of such phases and all depends upon what the CD is and what kind of uh, timer uh, configuration you're gonna take or the phases of this. And these are all the questions that you want to now answer. Yeah. So right now, let's just say that if you want to state with an energy gap, uh, we believe that 
the probability of getting longer bonds falls off exponentially with distance. But there are also gapless states where it doesn't. So, and exactly, you know, so just looking at this wave function doesn't tell you very much, but it's a proposal of what could happen. Um, another word we use today is that this kind of wave function uh, has long range entanglement uh, because these local constraints on who your uh, partner with propagates through the entire lattice, and that leads to certain, uh, you know, topological characteristics that we're, of course, wanting to describe. Okay. All right, but uh, so that's that's the proposal in 1973. And as far as I know, it appeared in some conference proceedings, uh, and and that's just there wasn't any work on it for a long time. Yes. So is it is it going to be? This was just an initial answer, or is it going to be important that there's no such a thing as like a GHC kind of structure where three qubit three of these sides are? Um, there are all such structures here. I mean, they, you can always decompose that into the spaces. So in some sense, this is without really telling you more about the CD uh, or actually finding some Hamiltonian proof where something like this makes sense. But what the meaning of it is, uh, is this kind of an empty statement. Any state can be decomposed into this expansion simply because if you have a singular state of n electron, I can make that singular state by uh, by doing a tensor product of the electrons and into singlet pairs and then going all the way to all of them. So there's, in fact, this set of this spaces are in fact over complete of the set of all. There are more states here than there are total uh, singlet states for n electrons. So then, yeah, so this is, you know, it's a, it's a visionary proposal, but it's not a theory by any means of anything. Okay. So, so this is where things stood until 1986. Uh, when you know this sort of phase diagram stuff, um, much of this had been worked out. It, it wasn't even known as D-wave, but there was a high TC superconductivity. Uh, and Anderson pointed out in '87 uh, that this has something to do with physics of the Hubbard model uh, and this type of state. Uh, and that was an amazing proposal because it set off so much activity, which is still continuing to this day. And, and so today we can answer these questions much more precisely. Uh, that uh, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So what uh, is this following the historical discussion? On one hand, you said that this is a basis. Yeah. Uh, which is in fact overcomplete. Yeah. And on the other hand, you say this kind of state. Uh, yeah. Just hold on. This is just meant to be uh, give you a flavor of where we're going. Let, let me make okay. Let me make a more precise statement right now, uh, <laughs> which you'll be happier with. I mean, I guess there were good reasons why no one followed up on this. Nobody knew what it meant. <laughs> okay, but now let's make a more precise statement uh, about this kind of state. Uh, which is the following. So, uh, and that's, well, here's a ground state, but like every ground state, this must be to really understand what you're talking about, we should say something about uh, the excitations. Uh, and this proposal, you know, I heard about it. I was a, a lowly postdoc in those days, uh, around 1987. Uh, many people probably knew it, but I suppose PWA probably knew it. Uh, Baskaran. Um, I probably heard it most clearly from Hilson around this time. Okay, so this is a more precise definition of what we mean by an RVB state. Um, RVB state has excitations. With fractional. Boson number or spin. In particular, the boson number Q, which I'll call, which is B dagger B of this excitation, can be one half, uh, or the spin SZ uh, can be plus or minus a half. I guess this is also plus or minus a half. 
Okay. And there really is no previous system well, uh, which had such fractal excitation, at least in two dimensions. In one dimension, there is uh, the concept of a domain wall. Uh, you know, future is known as the Jiki Ruby domain wall. Uh, in condensed matter, there's a domain wall between uh, two valence bond solid states. Uh, but those states actually, they do have fractional charge at the domain wall, uh, but they have a broken symmetry uh, in the box. So they don't really qualify uh, under the statement question I asked. So, in, so what's the idea here? Well, the idea here is, well, uh, here's the state, which we now call a spin-on state. Uh, again, it will be sum over all these configurations with some other C tilde of D. Uh, and this configuration will look something like this. Okay. Where maybe you have a free spin here and a free spin over there. Uh, and the rest of them are bound in single. So this is some gap excitation uh, to begin with. Okay. Yeah. And there's many, many, many such, such terms. Um, and really, there has to be a pair of them because if I take any local operator, for example, if I uh, flip the spin, uh, you know, I put, uh, I pick a side S1 and I raise the spin on the singlet bond. Um, but this will just give me, not that, it will give you uh, this, this, with some matrix on it here. So you create a pre pair of spin ones, uh, and then these can move apart um, and be separated. So this, one, this object here um, has Q equals plus or minus a half. So the statement we hear is that whatever the dynamics we're talking about, whatever system we're talking about, it's possible for these fractional charges uh, to separate out to infinity. So once you're, you know, that one can go off one end of the sample and you can now study this. So you have a fractionalized excitation with half a charge, uh, which is you know, just like some other quasi particles. So we have a quasi particle, uh, which has a fractional charge. Uh, which is free to move around uh, and doesn't have to be tied always to the other one. Okay. Um, right, so everyone get the proposal. Again, this is just a proposal, but it's a more precise proposal um, that if you had such a state with a gap uh, with bosons at half filling, um, then that state it's necessarily, you know, must have half charge excitations. Uh, that, uh, this half charge excitation, of course, you can't uh, create on its own. It always comes in pairs. Uh, and another way to say it is that there's no local operator uh, that you can act on this region of the sample to just create one of them. So once you have one of them, you're really in a different sector of the Hilbert space, which you can't get out of. Uh, so today we say, well, that's a super selection sector. There's a sector with half charge which is really totally disconnected, except from very non-local operators uh, to the sector where you don't have the half charge. And then this kind of disconnection uh, of this sector of the Hilbert space with half a charge, uh, you know, is kind of a quantum error correction. That's the, that's the idea behind uh, very roughly uh, that led Kitev to propose the idea of topologically protected quantum computation with such quantum states. Okay. All right, but I'm getting way ahead. Uh, but okay, so it, it was pretty clear that if such states existed, uh, they should have fractional charge. And in fact, especially Kibbelson had worked earlier on a uh, compound called polyacetylene, which is a one dimensional system which has a broken symmetry and that has these half charges I mentioned earlier. Uh, so there was a lot of experimental work on that, you know. Uh, before I came on the scene, before I knew anything about condensed matter physics. Uh, but anyway, so that 
idea transferred to this idea of fractional shard execution. The fractional quantum Hall effect that was after this or before this? This was around the same time. Okay. okay, but that takes me to the next point. So here's a proposal of fractional charge. Uh, and now the question is, uh, this still the bell short of a theory. We haven't proven that these are fractionalized. They haven't told you what these coefficients are. Uh, I told you much other than these fractional excitations exist. So can you make a theory for such a state of bosons and cluster? Okay, so the first theory for that is exactly what Juan mentioned, and not surprisingly, it was by Laughlin. So Laughlin wrote a paper and found also in 1987, which is again another brilliant paper. Uh, where he pointed out that for bosons at half filling, there is an RVB state. And Laughlin being Laughlin, uh, he very loudly said, this is the only RVB state. Okay, so, I, I'm sorry, you may be listening. <laughs> sorry, Bob, uh, if you're listening, uh, that was just a joke. Uh, but certainly in the paper, they make a statement that this is the theory of the RVB state. Uh, so Laughlin Kallmeyer said RVB is equivalent to fractional quantum hall. So they proposed a wave function for RVB. So their RVB was bosons. At mu equals one half, filling fraction mu equals one half in the in a fractional quantum Hall state. So today this is called the chiral spin liquid. Or maybe you can call it a fractional churn insulator. Um, and I could certainly spend a few lectures going into all of the physics of this, um, but I won't because, well, uh, we can do it later. I'll come to these topics a bit later, uh, but primarily because uh, we know this possibility, at least for the cube rates, doesn't work. Uh, but since that proposal in 1987, uh, there has been a lot of numerical work on other, other theoretical models. I think starting about 10 years ago, people started finding lots of theoretical models where in fact this proposal was correct. Uh, you know, models exactly of the Hubbard model with some first, second, third neighbor interactions uh, hopping, uh, you can get cut off spin liquid ground states. So that's well established today. Does this ground state break parity? Yeah, so that's the point I'm just coming to. Yeah. So if you study just the Z2 gauge theory, Again, I'm coming to that. So, that <laughs> Let me tell the story. <laughs> I'm interested in the history. Of it. Yes, that's that what I'm saying. Known, but that was known long before. Well, I mean, there, there was, of course, the Frank, uh, Frank and Schenker paper on Z2 gauge right. fields, um, but it had not been applied to this following question. So that that was a paper on gauge theory. It was not a paper on on emergent gauge charges. The, so you have to. That's going to be, of course, the answer that we came up with in 1990, uh, that there can be an emergent gate charge which reduces the problem to something very closely connected to fractal shank. Okay. So I'm coming to that. <laughs> so what was one of the features of this state? Well, one of the features of the state, as Juan mentioned, is that it breaks time reversal and parity. Uh, but more importantly, so in some sense, it's not an answer to the question I posed earlier. It does break the symmetry. But it doesn't break translational symmetry. That was the main thing we were worried about. So people were willing to give this a pass. Yeah, well, maybe time reversal is broken. Uh, but the other important thing this introduced uh, is the idea, which is very important in the uh, It introduced the idea that fractional charge implied fractional statistics. Uh, okay, or any ions. 
So for one important consequence of this wave function was, first of all, there was an explicit wave function. It specified all the CDs. That was great. Now we actually could compute the CDs in a computer. We wrote down a trial wave function, uh, and you can compute the coefficients in whatever basis you want it. Uh, and in fact, essentially the Laughlin state of boson hopping on this lattice. Uh, if you don't know what that is, we'll maybe come to that later. Uh, but I just want to, I mentioned this because of course, historically it was very important and it made this very important point uh, that if you had a gap phase with fractional charge, uh, then they were also, there would also be fractional statistics. So these objects, Q equals one half, uh, spin-ons, if you want to call them that, um, are uh, semions. Well, they're halfway uh, between um, uh, fermions and bosons. So what this means is that if you took this particular set of CD that Laughlin Kalmeyer told us about, uh, I should say, yeah, it's Kalmeyer Laughlin, uh, and you did an uh, adiabatic process when you took two of these spin-ons and moved one around the other, uh, exchange them, uh, then you pick up a phase factor, a very phase, uh, and that very phase factor is what leads to this fractional statistics. Um, and that phase factor will be plus or minus pi over two. So for bosons, it's two pi or zero. For fermions, it's pi. Uh, and for semions, which are halfway between, uh, there's half statistics. Okay. And this seemed, you know, really crucial to the structure of the states in those days. Uh, that once you had a global U1 charge fractionalized, then you really had no choice but to also give it. Uh, fractional statistics. And so I think many people were convinced, including people here at the IS, I think, that this had to be the answer to all the problems of the phase diagram that I just erased. Uh, okay, well, they could have been right, and there was a lot of beautiful work. But what happens when you start from this insulator and you introduce charge carriers? In fact, you do get a superconductor. Uh, at that time, it wasn't known it was D wave, so I don't think they. We looked into that question, but it did make a very important uh, proposal. Uh, there was a very important consequence, which is that time reversal and uh, time reversal uh, is broke, is spontaneously broke. In a rather strong way here. So the bosons, you know, are all moving in some from quantum hallway, they, are, they, they feel an effective magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field uh, is, in this case, induced spontaneously, and you can think of it as a churn number in the bands they're moving in. Again, don't worry if you don't know what these terms mean, uh, because uh, <laughs> this is just for historical purposes now. Um, and, and in fact, pretty soon I'm going to compute some of these things uh, for a different uh, class of states. Anyway, so time reversal is spontaneously broken. Uh, and so there were a lot of experiments in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, looking for this. Uh, fortunately, they didn't work out. There, is, there are some weak signatures of time reversal in certain regions of the phase diagram, but nowhere near uh, uh, in the kind of uh, chiral behavior that you expect uh, in, in this kind of fractional quantum hall state. You know, we'll be here if we think of the fractional quantum Hall state as happening in a very strong magnetic field. But on the microscopic scale, that's not such a strong field. Uh, and it can be spontaneously induced uh, in this internal space of these semions. Uh, but okay. Yeah. So uh, these uh, semions, or anyway, the particles with these fractional statistics. So uh, yeah. you were explaining in terms of like swap field operators is also. Uh, uh, there is also a consequence in terms of like occupation numbers, like really, uh, can I put uh, multiple guys, can I put two of them, or maybe I can put four or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, there, there is some such uh, set of theories in 1D, if I remember, uh, but I'm talking about 2D, and I don't think that point of view has been very useful in 2D. I mean, there you can just think of them hardcore particles 
uh, at least in space there. So if you bring two semions together, like if you put these two spin halves together, they can form a spin singlet and they can just disappear. Um, so two semions uh, is, is trivial. So uh, today we say this in terms of the fusion rule. If you call this semion an S, then S cross S is one. Okay. So we cannot think of a theory of non-interacting semions. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, they have to be hardcore to define the statistics. Yeah. Um, this is just an effective theory uh, of the model that I've defined. Okay. All right. I mean, I could really you could spend the major part of the rest of the course to talk about this. And if this had worked out, that's what I'd be doing. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about it. Also, for my personal reasons, of course, there's another proposal uh, which still is alive, which I'll now talk about. <laughs> All right. So we're looking for, as I said, looking for states of bosons that have filling or electrons with, with uh, unit density uh, on, the, on any lattice, which don't break any symmetry. And this one actually doesn't break anything. Uh, so this is a proposal made by uh, Nick Reed and myself uh, in 1990. Uh, and when independently around the same time, Few months later, I should note that this was before the onset of CONMAT. So this difference was really a pretty short time in those days. <laughs> in CONMAT, this, this, uh, this will never happen. Okay, CONMAT started in 92. <laughs> uh, and so this thing is now called the Z2 spin liquid. Um, and it also has uh, fractional, uh, it also has, has anions, uh, but it does not break and reverse it. And, you know, that's, of course, important uh, if you want to have a hope of this being relevant to at least the cube rate. Uh, okay. So, what, so it has a certain set of excitations. Uh, and it turns out the way it gets around these constraints that people thought were universal between fractional statistics and fractional charge uh, is by having more than one type of anion, uh, and then you can do it. Uh, and so what I'm going to do starting today and going on next week, I imagine, is actually showing you how this state comes out from just turning the track, starting with a specific Hamiltonian and seeing how the spectrum that I'm going to now write down emerges. So I know you'll have many questions, but within a week or two, I hope they'll be answered. So this thing has three types of anions, or if you count the trivial state as one, people normally say it has four types of anions. So there's, uh, let's say, four anions. Uh, there's the nothing state, where you, which is the ground state is in that sector. These are different sectors. There's a sector called E, and there's a sector called epsilon, and a sector called M. Um, and these anions have certain charges. So the ground state is, of course, is charge zero. You're measuring charge respect to the ground state. Uh, and then you have the spin-ons, but the spin-ons come in two varieties. There's two of them, the E and the epsilon spin-on. Uh, and there's an M particle, which is called, which has zero charge. So, uh, so these are called spin-ons. Of course, this notation came much later in 96 uh, from Kitaev's story cohort. None of that was known at that time. So we call it a spin-on. This is a spin-on. Uh, and this is sometimes called the Vison or a Z2 flux uh, vortex. And what about the statistics? Well, none of them are semions, but the self-statistics. What happens if you interchange? Well, this is just a boson. Uh, the E particle conventionally is also a boson, but this turns out to be a fermion, uh, and this is also a boson. Okay. So these are conventional statistics. So 
what so first of all, what it's saying that of the spin on state that I drew, there was spin three half here, and then a whole bunch of singlets, and then another free spin there. That each one of these comes in two flavors. There's the E spin on and the epsilon spin on. And the E spin on, if you exchange two E spin ons, it's a boson. If you exchange two epsilon spin ons, it's a fermion. Uh, and in fact, soon after 1987, there were a large number of papers saying, no, the spin on is a fermion. No, the spin on is a boson. Because in my theory, it's a boson. Uh, actually, both are right. We know today that they both exist in principle uh, as sectors. They may not be actual bound states, as you'll see. They may not be you know, quasi particles uh, that live forever, but they can definitely exist as super selected sectors. And where's the fractional statistics? Well, the fractional statistics are any pair. E, epsilon, and M are mutual semions. So when you have distinguishable particles, there's a, a new type of statistics that is possible in one dimension. Uh, you can take two distinguishable particles and take one all the way around the other. And you can ask if you pick up any phase factor. Uh, when you exchange them, you only take them around halfway because then you can translate and come back to the original configuration. Identical particles, take them halfway to get the statistical angle, but for mutual statistics, you take it all the way around. Uh, and you call them mutual semions, well, because if you take them all the way around, you get a phase factor of pi. If you took them halfway around, they'd be like semionic. That will break time reversal, but pi does not uh, break time reversal. So if you take uh, Take an M and an E around an M, you pick up a phase factor of minus one. And the important point about the minus one is that you can go clockwise or anticlockwise. It doesn't matter, you get the same phase factor, and that's why time reversal is preserved. So this is really the simplest state, uh, which has fractional charge and uh, doesn't break any symmetries. This is, uh, now we have a huge library of states, of course. <laughs> this is the simplest one. And what I'm going to do in uh, starting you know, in a few minutes uh, is really derive all of this from a very pedestrian approach. That we just start and do the kind of pathetics we've been doing uh, and just do it very carefully. Yes. Okay. Um, so one other thing you would have, which also was very confusing in the early days, uh, which is only now getting fully sorted out. Uh, there is a very complicated interplay here between symmetry and what we call topology. Uh, so these are systems that I'm talking about that have a conserved uh, number, conserved U1 charge, electron number, boson number, S spin, Sz. Uh, and it's because of the have a conserved number I can talk about fractional quantum numbers. I can talk about fractional charges. But they also have fractional statistics. Uh, and these seem to be tied to each other in a rather complicated way. Uh, it, can't, it seems you can't have one without the other. Uh, so at least it can that's right the fact that these are very different things, uh, at least this class of models. That's something that became clear by the Teos Torah code. But the Torah code was a different Hamiltonian in an even more uh, general space of models, where there was no charge, there was no concept of a no global U1 symmetry. Uh, but you had the statistics, exactly these statistics. So that made it clear that, you know, the idea of top, what was due to topology, what was due to just some general structure of fractional statistics or topological order, I sometimes said, uh, and which was this row. And what was, uh, and the, the, these charges were extraneous stuff associated with the global U1 symmetry. So today we have, you know, a very sophisticated theory of all of this, which most of which I don't know very well. And classifying this, this row is sometimes, uh, it falls under a branch of mathematics called neutrally modular tensor categories or something like that. <laughs> and then putting symmetries together with uh, these tensor categories is something, is a problem of current research. There was a, a series of long papers by Meissenberg, Casey, and collaborators recently, 
uh, on showing you how you could take a general symmetry G and put it together to some tensor category, and that leads to the theory of uh, G crossed modular tensor category. So, anyway, just to show you that uh, today we have a much deeper understanding of, uh, of many of these things, at least some people do. Uh, none of this was understood in those days. Uh, and what was particularly confusing to many people, certainly to me, uh, and I think also many of the other papers, was that there was no clear understanding of what is exactly due to symmetry and what is due to topology. But okay. Anyway, so I, I have only a dim knowledge of the, all these beautiful mathematical developments. I'm just going to take a very pedestrian point of view and show you now and construct this table. I'll take a couple of lectures probably to do it from scratch using, you know, these type of models, not, uh, not the solvable model of the tab, but the solvable model doesn't even have this, which is, as you can see, really crucial to, in the real world, this is absolutely important. We're talking about systems with conserved U1 charges. And they put long, you know, the, even the statement, my question I asked, uh, is it possible to have a state that doesn't break any symmetries with charge Q equals one half, average density one half? That just person has no meaning. Uh, unless you have a global symmetry. All right. Any questions with that historical introduction? <laughs> yeah. It's the same question I asked before. Maybe this is in hindsight, but the model analyzed by Farkin and Schenker yes. did have all these excitations and they didn't have the charge. Correct, yeah, yeah. So that was a pure Z2 gauge theory. Which is it's pretty close to the toric code, uh, so maybe, yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say that Kitayev should have been more explicit in its acknowledgement of toric code uh, of the Fredkin Shankar world. Uh, we certainly acknowledge it. We were influenced by it. We knew about it, uh, and uh, yeah. But the other difference is the models I'm talking about now. You know which. Is that um, yeah? We, we're not talking about things that are microscopically z to gauge theories. Uh, you know, in other words, they have a theory of quarks, and then they show in a certain regime the quarks can be free. What we're trying to do is start, start from a theory of baryon, the mesons, and show that it actually has quarks. That's a step that was not taken by Fredkin and Schenker. <laughs> it really hasn't been done anyway. So either by Kitayev. Uh, no, it, it, he did do it eventually. You know, it, it, it is there, but it's kind of hidden in the way, you know, the way you think about it. Uh, the E and the M excitations are really quarks in the spin variables he's talking about. Yeah. He's not so explicit about the game symmetries, which is why it's so beautiful, because the game symmetry is artifacts. In the end, you talk about talk engage in variant terms, which is what he did. That's what made it so clear. <laughs> The gauge invariant properties are these. Everything else is a gauge artifact of your choice of basis. <laughs> okay. Right, all right, so, uh, so there we are. So now we have to deal with uh, new type of state with long range entanglement, topological order, fractional statistics, Anyons, all of these things come together. Um, and, you know, of course, there were parallel developments around the same time in the field theory of the fractional quantum Hall effect and then Chen Simon's gauge theories, and uh, especially here at the IAS. Uh, and how they, all these connect are now, of course, very beautifully understood, but it was kind of curious how all this happened uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And I certainly was very lucky to be part of these remarkable developments. Okay. Um, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, regarding sky and spinly quid. Maybe you can put so your question in the chat. There is way to see why 
postpones and happening has I can't hear you. Oh. The connection is back. Please put your question in chat. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, uh, is okay. I'll continue. Uh, you put your question in chat, and uh, I'll I'll try to look at it a few minutes later. All right. So so let me just present. Uh, you know, with. with no, because that's the first thing. Okay. So, I mean, you, you can see that this is a Unlike the fractional quantum holiday, a rather complicated structure. Uh, you know, and what we know today, and we certainly didn't know this in those days, uh, that there are very general constraints which come from the mathematics of such phases. Uh, that if you even changed one one number in this in this matrix, anything, the whole thing would be inconsistent. Uh, and uh, it's kind of amazing to, for me to see how that happens because the math mathematical arguments are so abstract that it's hard to believe they have any physics in them, at least for me, but they do. They give you exactly these constraints and these. So I'm going to talk about, you know, let's just take the following uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, one of the nearest neighbors, J S I dot S J. Um, and do a mean field like uh, analysis of this. Uh, so the two cases I'll consider, uh, which are in the notes, are the square and the triangle lattices. Now, in reality, if you took specifically this model uh, with nearest neighbor coupling, we know the answer today. The answer is the boring answer. There is broken spin rotation symmetry, and you have uh, some kind of antiferromagnetism. Uh, but we're just going to force ahead with the mean field theory, uh, which looks for states without any broken symmetry uh, and hopefully has an energy gap um, uh, in the hope that even if the mean field theory is not correct for precisely this model, it's correct for some broader class of models. And that hope has been realized, although it wasn't clear in those days. Okay. Um, all right, so we want to compute the partition function which is crazy to the minus theta h. Uh, really, we're going to proceed in exactly the way we proceeded in some sense in the paramagnon theory, uh, but we are going to proceed in a way that doesn't break any symmetry, but there are no condensates that appear that are going to break symmetry. So the approach we're going to use, we're going to write, uh, we're going to introduce, and you know, influenced by these considerations from the early days, uh, where it was very clear that you should have at least excitations with fractional charge or fractional spin. So why don't you just make them the things you work with? Uh, so you introduce a, another boson, uh, which I call S, uh, S up and S down. There's two kinds of bosons uh, and they have fractional charge uh, or SZ equals one half. Plus minus a half. Or one quarter. Uh, no, one half. <laughs> yeah, they have one half. Oh, I mean, ordinary fermions have one half. Right, yeah. So, if these, so the point is that these spin operators are spin one operators. So all the, the Hilbert space of local operators are spin one objects. Ah, okay, so there's a. We are restricting ourselves to one electron per site. Uh, so basically what we're going to say is that the up state, we're going to now identify as a state of an up boson, and the down state, we're going to identify the state of a down boson. And these are the only two states. So then I have a constraint on each side. I've dropped the site label here. 
Okay, so there it is. I have a, a Hilbert space of two states up and down. I choose to write that as a Hilbert space of some fictitious boson, often called the Schwinger boson. Uh, although I'm not sure Schwinger ever used it, but that's what you call it. Uh, I probably did. Uh, and, uh, and the Schwinger boson has a constraint that uh, there's only one boson allowed on each side, but that boson can be either spin up or down. So distinguish that from the B dagger boson, the capital B boson, uh, which was very different. Okay, so their uh, up spin was uh, B dagger on the boson vacuum, and the down spin uh, was the vacuum. So here B dagger just S plus. It's a uh, you know it's a it's a physical operator. I can make an experiment which operate the B dagger. Um, and uh, it's a hardcore boson, so it had a very different constraint. Uh, the constraint for B dagger B was less than or equal to one. So it's, so it's uh, an inequality here, it's an inequality. Uh, that's, of course, in, in doing actual calculations, we much rather deal with equalities than inequalities. Uh, okay. And this boson carries spin one, and these boson carry spin a half because. This is some fictitious vacuum, uh, and you, add, you get an object which is, which is spin zero, and this is spin a half. Okay, the physical operator here, of course, can be written in terms of these bosons. There's too many S's here, but hopefully it's clear. Uh, this is capital S, is one half S dagger alpha, sigma alpha beta over seven S beta, where these are the Pauli matrices. So you can check that the action of this object on the right hand side has exactly the same action um, as the action of S on these states up and down. The commutation relations, everything works out. And in fact, this kind of trickery is probably the simplest way to derive all the Klebsch coordinate coefficients of angular momentum. I think that's probably what we have seen. Maybe that's why they're called sugar bosons. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to use these bosons and our, with the benefit of hindsight, this is a good thing to do uh, because then to begin with, if these bosons now you know, become actual excitations of some quantum ground state of this model, uh, I already have one column of my table filled. <laughs> okay, and what we'll see is, so all we're trying to do is get this guy, and we'll be forced to get the other guys. That's what will come out of this theory now. <laughs> um, all right, so now what's the most important property of the boson? In addition to constraints, that it induces an emergent gauge symmetry. So there's an emergent gauge symmetry. Uh, which is that you can take S alpha, this is small s, and e to the i theta. And this can be a function of space and time, S alpha. And you could make a rotation of the phase of the boson uh, in any way you want, and no physical operator will change. The physical operators have to be gauge invariant. Uh, all observables are invariant under the symmetry. Or gauge invariant. So this immediately follows from the answers I've written above. So I have written, rewritten this innocent looking model of spins as a gauge theory. In this case, it's a U1 gauge theory. Um, and it's a U1 gauge theory with some matter fields, which are the S fields. Uh, and so now, as a gauge theorist, you now have to ask the question. What you know, whenever you have a gauge symmetry, you ask, uh, what phase is the gauge theory in? And there are basically a few phases. 
there's the Coulomb phase or the weak and fine phase, where you actually have a photon, uh, which is propagating long distances. Uh, there could be a confining phase uh, where you know, these gauge fluctuations are so strong uh, that the S, which I think of as quarks, are confined into mesons or protons. And in fact, all the phases we talked about so far are confining phases implicitly. And then you can also have the analog of the Higgs phases, uh, like in the theory of weak interactions. Um, and sometimes the Higgs phases are the same as the confining phases, and sometimes they're not. And in that statement lies all of this. <laughs> understanding that statement uh, is the key to understanding everything we're going to talk about, and including understanding this table. Okay. So we want to, so this is absolutely crucial to understand what's happening to this gate symmetry that comes from, you know, it really comes from the, the fact there's only two states on each side. It comes from the projection operation, the fact that Hilbert space has been restricted uh, and all other states are much higher energy. Now you might think, well, uh, well, that, that's an artifact because the other states uh, are in fact not at infinite energy. Those are, they're really up there. So maybe those violate the constraint uh, with double, you know, two electrons on any given site. And, and so maybe all of this is an artifact uh, of descending those to infinity. Uh, that's also a good question and a deep question. And the answer is no, it's not an artifact. Uh, in fact, you can introduce all kinds of states uh, which violate the gauge constraint. Um, and the way you set it up is that you can think of the state that violates the gate constraint as another matter field, which has a gate charge. So what you're just doing is in, introduce some heavy matter field with the gate charge. Uh, and we know that heavy fields <laughs> don't have any effect on the low energy physics. So in that sense, uh, the emergent gate symmetry uh, is really exact. It's an exact statement of the emergence. If, it, if, you have, if it, the gate symmetry was realized in the right phase, is an exact statement of these properties. In particular, all these properties here, these are the central properties which don't depend upon whether U is infinity or not. Many other things you write down, like as we'll write down various operators, Wilson loop operators, and so on, don't work <laughs> uh, when, uh, when you violate the constraint a little bit. But these don't get changed. Okay. And that's really the invariant context. Okay, so what I have to show you is how you go from here to here. Any questions? All right, so we make this decomposition and we go ahead uh, and uh, write the partition function. So there's a few more tricks uh, we want to play. So we're gonna, and I'm not gonna get all the signs right, but, uh, you know, worked out in the notes. Also in the notes, what I do is I generalize the SU2 symmetry of the spins to uh, SU SP2N or something like that. Uh, and then you get a formal one over N expansion, but I will spare you that algebra uh, on the board. Uh, basically, for everything I want to do, if you want to make it more systematic, uh, you can make it completely systematic in a one over N expansion. But I'll just work for SU2 at least on the board. So we're going to take this, you can rewrite this S1 dot S2 in terms of these bosons and using some algebra, uh, you can write this as the following operator. Okay. In fact, we've done something with this earlier in the BCS theory, uh, but we're now we're doing it for both, so that doesn't change very much. Uh, so the epsilon alpha beta, S dagger one alpha S dagger beta times the emission conjugate epsilon gamma delta S dagger. Okay, so this plus some constants. Okay. Oops. So the left-hand side is a gauge invariant operator, but so is the right-hand side, because on site one, um, I have one dagger and one non-dagger. 
And similarly, in site two, I have one dagger, one null dagger, uh, and therefore this gauge invariance holds. So the right hand side is also a gauge invariant operator. Okay. So what I'm going to now do is use a Hubbard Stranovich transformation. Um, and I'm going to decouple this. I'm going to put this in the partition function uh, and I'm going to rewrite this in terms again uh, by a field about Q12 squared. Uh, so again, I'm keeping track of all the signs. For this particular operator, um, I can write as after an integral over Q as Q12 times that object. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to take this exchange interaction and decouple it uh, in the spin singlet pair channel. And of course, I want to do that because that's what lowers the energy. I'm looking for a ground state of lots of singlets. Uh, so I'm somehow imagining that this, this singlet object, this boson, this is a pair of bosons, is going to condense. So this Q is going to condense. So when I'm done, uh, this will be a path integral. I'm going to try to write the whole thing out. B Q I J. I do it for every bond. B S I alpha. And I also have a constraint D lambda of exponential beta D tau L. Really, the, all the steps here are identical to what we did for, for the theory of superconductivity or paramagnon theory. I'm just taking decoupling in a slightly different channel. Well, L, okay, now let me write it, actually try to get the precise expression. And I'll come to the chat questions in a minute. Once I write this out to make an important point. Okay. Okay, so this is there's a bond variable, someone ij, um, j, ij squared. Okay, there's a factor of two here, and then a gij, uh, uh, Then I have this I lambda I alpha S minus one. Someone I. Okay, so this is the same manipulation I've done many times. Uh, we just take the quartic operator, this quartic operator, and decouple it into a quadratic operator at the cost of introducing another conjugate variable. Uh, and if you do the integral over the conjugate variable, which you can do, the integral over Q is Gaussian. You can just do the integral by completing the square. And when you do it, you'll just get back to the original Hamiltonian expressed in terms of these S's. Um, and um, the, there's a Lagrange multiplier lambda. If you do the integral over lambda, you will impose this constraint on each side. All right, so there's our theory. Now it's a theory of spin a half bosons uh, with half charge and another boson Q. And now that Q has some special properties that we haven't met before, uh, as do the S. And now again, those special properties have to do with the gauge symmetry. So let me just write down the gauge symmetry. And that'll probably be the, and I'll turn to the questions. So the most important property of this path integral uh, is that it's invariant under this gauge symmetry. I mean, it has to be because the original Hamiltonian was invariant.
Um, so let me again get the signs right. All right. Let's up. Changing the notation a little bit to be consistent with the notes. I rho i of tau, rho i of tau in any function. Q i j. Okay, so if you make these transformations for any rho i, everything, every term in the path integral will go back. The whole total Lagrangian uh, is invariant. Okay, so it's a U1 gauge theory. U1 gauge theory. And really at this point, this is, purely an artifact of our choice of these variables. It's not, it tells you no physics. It just tells you that you made a certain choice of variables. So I made a choice of variables uh, in which uh, I just decided to enlarge the degrees of freedom, uh, put a constraint, and then the system tells me, well, actually these degrees of freedom are spurious uh, and the actual observables are gauge invariant objects. The first order kinetic time for the SIs. Oh, uh, the Lagrangian. Yes, there is. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Hope it's in the notes. I think it is. Okay. Let me cut that off. Okay. Finish. So the fact that we're talking about bosons at integer half integer filling or electrons at integer filling has entirely to do with that that one over there. Okay, so one wasn't there, everything changes. <laughs> this is the thing uh, that's giving us the constraint that we are in this region where we're trying to find a state that doesn't break any symmetries, and we're using these gauge dependent variables to do it. Okay, and we made a certain choice. So why did we do this? Well, we did this because we we are influenced by the earlier arguments. Uh, that whatever state you get, better have excitations that happen to just fit. And we say, okay, well, imagine it's a boson. Let's see what happens. Okay. And in the end, we were successful in showing that this kind of state is stable. But what we found along the way is that actually there are other excitations too that we hadn't anticipated when we started on this road. And, okay. All right, so let me just take a quick look at the chat. But the question is, uh, is there an easy way to see why bosons at half filling is gapped? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> That's exactly what we're trying to show. Uh, I mean, I, I gave you the history. So the question I pose is, is, can you take a system of bosons at half filling and get a gap state? Then the answer by Anderson was yes. And Anderson proposed in a different language, a possible wave function. Um, and now we're trying to proceed with that uh, idea. See, what are the properties of the state? One must have fractional charge. And what we're going to see from this discussion next lecture, it must also have some kind of fractional statistics, which will come up soon. And other topological property that is forced on you uh, the moment you have uh, the fractional charge. So that's not easy at all. That's the question we're trying to answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. So we'll uh, continue now. So the, the, the big question really is, uh, 
you know, we want this gate symmetry to not be in a confining phase. So we want two things. We don't want to break any symmetries, and we certainly haven't. Everything is SU2 invariant. But we now we want to be able to do a serious job of understanding the fluctuations associated with the gate symmetry. So there is some kind of photon-like object, and we want to do a non-perturbative analysis of the fluctuations of that photon, uh, and then show that the fluctuation of that photon doesn't do what you know uh, the theory of strong uh, color forces does. It doesn't confine these s particles back into spins. It could, in fact, there is a phase it does. Uh, and when you study that, those, and this was whole line which I won't go into now. This is something Nick Fried and I did before we wrote this paper in '89. We showed that. Okay, if you assume this photon is confined, we found that because of this minus one, uh, there would be a broken symmetry. So, so once you can find these objects, uh, then uh, you are forced to break a symmetry. So that turns out to be also quite non-trivial, but we won't talk about that. We'll talk about the region right now of uh, showing you the possibility, but there's no broken symmetry. And those necessarily will have these other ideas. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Did you write down the mean field consistency condition explicitly here? I'll come to that next time. But this is just an exact statement over the path it will go. The next step will be to now take a saddle point, find a saddle point of this path it will go, uh, and then do uh, uh, consideration of fluctuations about the saddle point, both perturbative and non perturbative. And we're going to do all of that over the next few lectures. Those are the steps. So the next step is to find the saddle point. Then expand about the saddle point. We'll find a global saddle point, but we'll find many other saddle points. And you have to sum over all the saddle points. That's the task for the next few lectures. <laughs> all right. I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing you do also in field theory. There'll be you know, instant. No, they're not instant. There'll be various. Uh, solitonic objects that will come out of the saddle points here. Yeah. Is there a term you can add where the S's are interact across a spatial link by adding another gauge field in that direction? Sure, sure, you can add. But then what's the rationale of not including them? Oh, uh, well, uh, you could, I mean, uh, what can you, you want to, so I can take any set of bonds. I can the QIJ live on every bond. So I have interaction with any pair of bonds. You could also have things so like this. The point S is that. So yes, yeah. So that, yeah. So you can include it. And uh, I'm just not doing it for simplicity. In this particular SPN large n limit, uh, then only the Qs appear. So there's another decoupling which you can do is something like P dot P squared minus P S dagger S P I J. Uh, yeah, so you can also do that. Uh, nothing I say will change as a consequence. So this is what you normally do in the CPN phase. Right, so I think you're implicitly thinking of this gauge transformation as slowly varying on, this, on the spatial scale. That's one um, bias you have to completely lose. Uh, this gauge, I haven't told you how smooth this is on the lattice scale. No, it could have some very rapid variation on the lattice scale. It's still a gauge symmetry. And in fact, understanding Precisely that question. That's at the heart of the whole thing. Understanding how to take the continuum limit of this gauge symmetry. Uh, that's what tells you about what are the emergent excitations. That's, that's the task that we have. Exactly that. And you can do that with this term, without that term. I mean, it's all well understood, but I'm just taking the simplest rule. It's all a question of, you know, what's the fate of this uh, on the lattice scale? Yes. So uh, this uh, field variable QIJ, does it describe a dimer coupling? Yes, and you'll see. Yes, absolutely. It describes there's a condensate of QIJ. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, that, that basically is what describes the RVB state. Uh, and there will be various defects in the QIJ. And, and that will become the N particle, as we'll see. <laughs> Any other questions? 
All right. Well, all of this is in the notes in well, not quite the same format, but uh, and many more details are there.